everyone. I'm Paul Flanagan, and uh, welcome to tonight's uh, Compliance Career Panel. It's a program for compliance, cybersecurity, and privacy. And uh, I want to thank uh, our panelists, Karen Gallagher, Ezra Krauss, Ben Walsh, Paul Flanagan, myself, and, and Jared Miller. And um, just wanted to introduce you uh, to the, the Career Services Office um, that they, you'll, hopefully, you'll be able to find information and um, you know, career information there. There's also um, a information on compliance, privacy, cybersecurity there that you can check out. There's the simplicity as well, um, but they're there really to help you, um, you know, in, in this particular area in this field, because this is really truly, I think one of the most exciting fields and um, analysts I think will be able to speak to that um, and, and how all, all of these areas are starting to merge together. And I think that's why we wanted to have this particular event tonight. I'm gonna to start out, uh, I'm gonna have the panelists introduce themselves and their compliance journey. I figure I'll just go down the line and start uh, asking you individually, I'd say a couple of minutes on that and then uh, we'll, we'll go into some other questions. But I think I'll start uh, with Karen Gallagher. Um, Karen, would you be open to uh, open just introducing yourself and a little bit about your compliance background? Sure, absolutely. My name, as Paul said, is Karen Gallagher. I've been around the healthcare system in Philadelphia since the early 90s. Um, I started work when I was about two or three. Um, and I, I've seen so many changes in this field. And I like what Paul said, that you have all these kind of worlds colliding. You have coding, compliance, regulatory. Um, so I've been in this field basically since before EHRs, when it was paper records. And, and paper trails had to be audited. Now it's a, it's a, lot, uh, it's a lot less difficult with, with the invention of the EHR. Um, right now I'm currently with Mainline Health um, as their physician auditing supervisor. I think in a lot of ways that physicians are kind of judged harshly uh, today and they don't really know about coding and regulatory. And I think that um, I look at that as my personal mission to help them educate themselves. Thank you. Um, so, hi, uh, I'm Ben Walsh. Uh, I graduated Drexel Law in 2019. Um, my compliance journey, as it were, is uh, accidental, as most compliance journeys tend to be. Uh, I took an administrative law course, um, and I just kind of found the regulatory aspect of law to be very interesting. That led me to taking some courses in compliance, uh, where uh, Paul Flanagan and I actually met. I then spent some time uh, working in the compliance department at Jefferson, and I currently work uh, as a security compliance analyst doing uh, cybersecurity, data privacy, uh, and some levels of HIPAA compliance at a software company called Epicline. But I definitely didn't get here on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I tripped and fell into it, so. Uh, okay, so next I'm, I'll go over to Ezra Kraus. Hi, um, I'm Ezra and I'm an attorney and I also stumbled into the compliance field as Ben. Uh, about four years ago, when I was at my previous company, which was an aerospace commercial software company, I, I was given a contract that I had to read through that had something about a privacy shield and uh, which led me down the route of um, reading the GDPR, then the e-privacy laws, CCPA, CPRA, and I some, somehow I became the expert in that field and nobody wanted to deal with it, so it was all mine. Um, so I started the privacy compliance program over there and um, basically got through all our um, vendor security uh, risk management and um, signed, prepared signed uh, numerous DPAs. And since we were a software company, we also had, um, we were using a lot of open source uh, software licenses. So the other side of compliance for me was um, designing a process for vetting these uh, open source licenses uh, with the, working with the development team. So it, it's definitely a very interesting field. I've really enjoyed it. And I moved on to the um, biotech industry. And so I had to learn um, the new lingo <laughs> in that area. <laughs> so went from software to um, pharma, which is completely different, but the, the laws are the same that I'm dealing with. It's still the GDPR, the CCPA and all that. 
um, I just had to reread everything um, to learn it from a different perspective because I ignored all that those sections that had, were dealing with the healthcare. Um, so th that's how I got here, um, and I am continuing at my current position on uh, dealing with all the privacy, um, <coughs> privacy and security thing. And I, well, I, I added the security stuff now, and uh, I've decided I needed a little bit more uh, knowledge in that field. So I'm actually uh, started an LLM at Drexel. Wonderful. And, and I, what I'm hearing from everybody tonight already, and I and myself, is that you stumbled into the field. Uh, we all kind of stumbled into this field, but what we're finding out as we're stumbling into this field that we're wearing many hats. I know this from Ben, and I'll pick on you in a second, Ben, but when I hear uh, most of my colleagues in this world, they stumble into the field, they start working in a particular area, but then while they work in that area, about three or four other areas seem to be dumped onto them at the same time. And what I heard you say, Ezra, was that, you know, the laws are the same, but then you're having to apply them in different worlds and different fits. So I'll come right back to you. Um, you say you stum stumbled into it. I'll take this to the other two panelists, you know, Ben and Karen, but as you stumbled in, did, did, you, did you have to learn those areas on, on the fly? That's oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, sorry, Ezra. Yeah, that's that's oh. my off the cuff question. Like, yes. how did you, you know, when you I, I I learned everything on my own. Yes, I started. You know, I had no idea about any of these things, so I just started digging into it. And I took a bunch of uh, webinars. Read. I started following uh, various attorneys who were writing about this this field, and um, you know, reading every article they wrote. And we engaged one of those attorneys because he, he was great. So. Um, yeah, I, I learned everything on the job, and that's why I feel like um, I had to get this LLM because I, I have a lot of holes still, I yeah. feel, um, and I think right. it would be better to have a whole, the whole picture. Ben, that kind of ties up. I mean, I think we're asking, is, what's the day in the life like for you? I mean, what do you see as your role? But it sounds like there's many roles, and I think same with Karen, but I'll, I'll go to you, Ben. Um, what's the day in the life for you like, and are you having to learn a lot? On, on a daily basis uh, for your role? Uh, sure, so uh, one of the nice things about the company I work at is just kind of like flexibility. So as far as like when I work, as you know, as long as I put in my 40 by the end of the week, right? Like kind of when I do that is, 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 is good. And honestly, if you're in a compliance background, one of the things you have to remember going into it is that there's a lot of work you do on your own but there's also way more work that you rely on other people to send you things to do the work that you do. So right. that level of flexibility I found is actually really nice, you know, cause if I need a report from, from some part of my organization, you know, and I send, I'm sending them an email at seven 30 in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning, no one's reading that email right, right then. And, and they're not, they're definitely not sending that report right then to you. So, you know, the flexibility to kind of step away from it or to do other things um, is really, I find is really helpful, but, no, it's totally true. Uh, I, I am some days I'm an auditor. Some days uh, I'm I'm third party risk management. Uh, mm -hmm. Some days I'm a regular attorney. I still do contract reviews, uh, security reviews. Um, I work with the attorneys at uh, the attorneys that we use at iPipeline as as well. But I'm I'm doing red lines as well, right? So I'm an attorney some days. I'm an auditor some days. Um, I'm I'm a third party vendor manager one you know one day. Uh, and, and some days I'm, I'm reporting up through to the company that owns us. So some days I'm, I'm a presenter as well, right? So we are really wearing many hats. Um, and you never know when you're going to be wearing which hat. That's the thing I think is most interesting about uh, compliance, especially where I'm sitting, where I'm just kind of, where I'm getting a lot of the work that's fed in from other parts of the business. There's a lot of, hey, today you're going to be this, right? I'm not choosing what I'm going to be. Someone's telling me what I'm going to be. But that's okay, right? It does. It's a little scary, <laughs> but you know, I was gonna say actually, uh, piggybacking off of what Ezra said, being an attorney here is actually really helpful. It's not a requirement, obviously, um, but the ability to just kind of like read statutes and a not hate yourself and b um, be able to understand kind of the, the the nuances in the law and in the contracts, it, it's helpful to be an attorney. And I want to emphasize to the students who are watching and will watch that like. The skills you're learning in law school are are actually really useful here, as well. Absolutely, 
And I can say that coming from a non-lawyer perspective. So in audit, in physician auditing, we intersect with a lot of different uh, partners. So we have vendors, which you have to do vendor audits. If you're doing a vendor audit, you then have to audit the vendor contract and make sure that everybody's fulfilling each part of the contract. You can't go to someone and accuse them of, uh, you know, not doing something appropriately when you your, yourself, your organization isn't following the letter of the contract. So I think that, um, and, and these regulations, Sometimes I wish people would just speak in normal language, but that's just not the way that it is. <laughs> so I'm not ashamed to say it. And Paul vouched for me on this one. The way <laughs> I taught myself was all by myself and we didn't have webinars, right? I went to the library in Chestnut Hill <laughs> and sat there every night and read. Um, and still to this day, I have my definition because in this field, in compliance, the way you define a word is so very important. And I think that people forget that, right? So I might say something um, that's interpreted three different ways, depending upon somebody's point of view. So I think um, for me, reading all the legalese, as I call it, no disrespect to attorneys, but reading all the legalese um, take up most of my time. <laughs> And then interpreting it in a way that I can communicate it effectively with people, you know, from stakeholders of all different levels, from patient service rep all the way up to physician provider and have it make sense. I mean, I think that's why this is such an incredible field. Um, and because I think it's exploding. Co co compliance as a field has been around for probably about 25 years. I've been in it 25. But the fact that it's still fascinating because of all the risks that are out there, there's always yeah. new risks. And cyber mm -hmm. is the new great big risk that, that, that all companies face. Privacy is the field that, that everybody's facing. And so yeah. it seems to not have a home. So it seems to get dumped uh, into the compliance world or one of the places is compliance, but I think it's growing. So what I'm hearing all three of you say is there's, there's no real set job description. You know what I mean? It says <laughs> this, but then next day you're doing something else. And I, there's good and bad to that, but I, I liken it to good. The good is from what I hear Ben, you say, and Ezra, what do you say? Uh, I, I, that, and Karen, all th three of you have said you're doing various jobs all the time and you're continuously having to learn. So I'll take it back to Ezra for a minute. Um, just what kind of people do you work with then in these roles? Um, who are the people you're working with on a daily basis? And I'll take it back to Karen and Ben after Ezra uh, talks on it. Yeah, the, what I really do enjoy is actually that I work with everyone at, at the company. And I, it was the same at the previous company, at the software um, company. And I get to know, you know developers, marketing people, salespeople, because it touches every area. And uh, you have to build these relationships with everyone to, so that they think about you. Next time they're about to do something, they come to you first be, instead of, oops, I did this, um, what do we do now? <laughs> so I, I, I like the fact that we get to uh, learn uh, what everyone's role is and um, what, what, working with all of them. But I do work very closely with um, IT, obviously, and security. And um, I also work um, very closely with the general counsel who um, reports to the CEO and the board. So uh, my voice is heard upwards, which is great um, because it's important. Um, but but that's, that's the fun part of the job is to get to know everyone. Um, whereas I feel like, um, you know, being just an attorney in contracts, you just do contracts all day and you don't get to really talk to very many people. Uh, ben? Yeah, I mean, a similar thing. Um, <clears throat> actually, I have a little anecdote about this. I, w when I was still working in an office, uh, jokes, um, and, and actually when I was working at my company's headquarters, I interact with our, our support people a lot, and <clears throat> they send us stuff, right? If a customer raises an issue um, to us, you know, we're, we're kind of that second line of defense there, you know, once, once they, they have their crack at it. So, um, uh, you know, one of the days, one of the days I just kind of tapped on the secure room, I, I had baked a pie at home and, and, uh, I wasn't going to allow myself to eat the whole pie. 
Um, <laughs> so I said, you know what? The, the, the support people could use some love. So I just dropped the pie off with them. And it's been great because my relationship with them has, has always been good. But, you know, some of that is you have to build those relationships because you want those people to yeah. trust you. A lot of times compliance in the department of no or the com- or the department of you should do this instead or the department of here are 10 extra steps that you should take. And the truth is, if you go into compliance thinking everyone's going to love you, you're, you're, you're kind of kidding yourself a little bit. Um, but you can make them love you. Right. So it, for me, I think the, the best part of it is built. I like, as Hesro said, building those relationships. Um, but also like it, it's it's a two way street. I think you have to build it with them as well. And and, um, you know, take time to get to know those people as people, because if you're always interacting with them professionally, they're going to hate you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I completely agree I... with what Ben just said. I mean, at the beginning, it was, oh, my God, she's coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it went to, you know, after they got to know me and I got to know them, mm-hmm. it was more of, a, hey, let's work together. I'm here to find right. a solution. This is the law. We have to do it. But let's find a solution that will help you um, get there. Exactly. Uh, right. Karen, do you, you want I was just gonna, Yeah, I was just going to jump in really quickly and say that um, I think stakeholder engagement is very important. And I think that the way you treat people in compliance is very important also. Um, and like Ben said, you have to engage them. Sometimes you can engage them with food. Sometimes you can engage them with your personality. But the key <laughs> is to engage them. <laughs> so, uh, you, you, I, so there's a question I, I like to throw out, um, and it's kind of, it, what's a day in a life like? Because I think that's really a, a lot of people thinking about this career. And you've got, you guys have all touched on it, but I'm kind of wondering, like, on a daily basis, like, and I know you're going to say it depends because that's the great answer to, to give here. But I think they're going to want to know if I'm if I'm somebody out there that's not in the compliance field or I am wanting to get into this area that is compliance, privacy, cybersecurity. What 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 does your day look like? Each of you, I just, I'll go right back to you, Karen. What and then we'll go over to Ben and to um, Ezra. What, what uh, like you walk in? What do you, what do you okay. look like? A typical day. So, a so typical day, right? I, all right, right. What's a typical day look like? But so really, I'm going to tell you 90% of my day is spent with relationship management, That's right? Excellent. In one form or another, whether I'm looking at a contract or I'm looking at an audit or we're developing a new service line for physicians. So we have to figure out what the regulatory uh, requirements are. It's all about relationship. Um, and again, you know, you don't want to be a Debbie Downer in compliance, but you want to look at risk and you want to assess, assess it appropriately. But it's the connection before that that matters because you need that honesty from each stakeholder. So I'm going to say that my typical day is spent kind of soothing over somebody's hurt feelings or somebody's feelings who are potentially going to be hurt by the answer that I'm going to give them because they can't do what they want to do. So it's really, um, relationship management with some contracts and regulations sprinkled in. I like that, Ben. Um, I have learned to love Outlook in a way that I never <laughs> thought I would love Outlook. Um, you know, I, I, I come in, I, I come into this lovely office here, um, sit down and uh, crack open Outlook. I, and all, through, all the reminders I've set for myself to follow up with people, you know, all the things that have come in from the, the night before, we have offices all over the world. So we we have, you know, stuff will come into me at ungodly o'clock in the morning, um, you know, for me to be to be looking at. And a lot of the, the first major chunk of my day, even before uh, my boss who's in Salt Lake is even working, um, is just making sure that I'm getting back to the people who, who need me, right? And who, who needs the, the person who sits in my function. And again, some it is kind of that relationship stuff, but you know, okay, which which vendor that we're potentially bringing in gave me a response to the questionnaire we sent them? Um, you know, what audit can I be can I be getting information for? You know, what what's kind of doing around the organization that I need to be tuned into? You know, did we have an incident or an issue that came up last night while I was asleep? Like, you know, if so, like, what do I need to do for that? Who do I need to to talk to and, and, and things of that nature. It's a lot of 
um, you know, before I be, even can put on my uh, my music for the day, I need to like have Outlook open and just kind of figure out what's happening. Because the truth is, my day is essentially dictated to me by Outlook, right? What emails are coming in? Who needs me? When do they need me? What do they need doing? Also Jira, right? Like not to plug, you know, Jira or anything, but that <laughs> the, the task management systems that we use, whether it's Outlook or Jira or some other program, like they define your life. And especially when you, you know, when you spend a lot of your time, you know, looking at ticketing systems and, and reacting um, or trying to be proactive, uh, you know, having a way to track your tasks through and to tell you kind of what I'm supposed to do today and tomorrow and the next day. I mean, that that's how I spend my days. And, and that's really like, that's the day in my life. So. Thank you. Astra, you, uh, you want to? Yeah, I can add a little bit myself. I, I mine is mostly um, redoing my to-do list every morning because it changes every day. <laughs> and uh, I have a giant task board in Teams. Uh, it's called Planner, and I use that a lot. And I actually have two interns that I work with, so I pr I give tasks in there and I reassign everything on a daily basis, quite honestly. Um, and you know, depending on whether I was requested to react to something right away, I do that. But it's a lot of um, project management and there's so many aspects um, to the role that you have to be sure to be on top of every every bit of it. And it, you know, ideally I, I would do one after another, but that's not really reality. I have to do them all at once. So, and that's why I reorganize the to-do list on a daily basis. I think you touched on something because it's like a project management. And that's really what I, I think of compliance. A lot of this is project management. Ben had alluded a lot of this as, and I think, and as for you too, but you both have you know, a lot of degrees and you're, you're in that world, but you don't have to be a lawyer to do this, but what you really have to do is be able to um, uh, be effective in time management because there's so many issues that are coming your way. And I think as for you touched on it, you know, this project management, because you're going in every day with tasks to do, but then there's like a whole load of tasks dumped on you that day. Mm -hmm. I that usually the biggest issues came on Friday at five o'clock. There would be something that would explode on a Friday and I have to deal with that. Or I would come in on Monday knowing what I was going to do the whole week and realizing by Friday, I didn't do any of the things I thought I was going to do on Monday. I was doing all these other things. Help me out here. What, you know, in this role for all three of you, how do you address it? I think you, you touched on it very well, but what, what do you do? when you have so many issues and so many risks, because that's that's on your slate. And I think that's different than most other jobs out there. So for me, I, I'm very happy that I got my the company I left where it needed to be. So I finally got through my to-do list before I left and it was a really good feeling. Um, but you just keep, keep at it, you know, you, you just, um, keep doing one after the other. You can't just let go of the things that you, and that, that's why it's extremely important to be organized. So if you're using Jira or Teams or whatever it is, you have to have a constant understanding of what you're doing, prioritizing the things that are higher risk, prioritizing the things that are happening immediately. Um, so I think it's very important to be well organized, to be able to stay on top of it. You just keep going at it until it's done. I mean, it's never done, done, but to a point where it's satisfactory. And how do you work with the other stakeholders that think their risks are more important than the ones that you've raised? Meaning, meaning how do you work within a system that prioritizes this risk? Well, I get to prioritize my own stuff, but uh, obviously there's something urgent coming in constantly from another department that I need to, you know, we, we work in Europe and we have clinical trials and uh, they need me to look at the contract right away and what it says because it's related to privacy. And they're like, we, we need this right now because it's gonna be translated and it's going out tomorrow. So I stop what I'm doing um, and I get that done first. And unfortunately, like you just said, you know, some days at the end of the day, I feel like I had a really bad day because I didn't touch my to-do list at all. and. Yeah, I did a million other things, but it wasn't my, on my to-do list. I go back at it the next day. <laughs> Karen, do you see that issue too? Absolutely, absolutely. And I use OneNote. So if anything ever happens to OneNote, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do or where I'm supposed to be. And that's just it. 
Um, and, and yeah, you just keep moving things up or move them down. Um, today we had a surveyor come into one of our facilities and tell us something absolutely outrageous, but that starts dominoes in motion. You know, the first person gets, gets hysterical and then all down the line, everybody's hysterical when really there's not an issue, but you have to get to that right person um, at that time and tell them, you know, there's not an issue. So um, yeah, each day is just really interesting and crazy. The most important thing that I've learned is that you always have to remember, no matter what goes on in your day, it's so important for you to find time to take care of whatever you need to take care of for you, right? So I always find that if, if I'm getting into a compliance rut, I call it, where I'm like, oh, why doesn't anybody understand how important risk is? Blah, blah, blah then I have to step away and take care of myself because I'm taking, I'm taking the risk way too seriously at that point. You have to know when to turn it off, which is hard, especially in these remote working days, knowing when to turn things off. I was gonna actually touch on that after Ben talked, but I was gonna ask you three what it's like to do this uh, from home or from so going in and out and what that's like, but I'll come right to that. That'll be the next question. I'll follow up with it. But Ben, I would like to hear your points on, on what the other two were talking on. I mean, for me, you know, prioritization, again, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I have someone who I report to, right, who does most of my assigning, right? So if stuff isn't coming in from other parts of the business, then, you know, I'm looking to see what, what my boss is finding. But the other thing is too, a lot of what we do comes from customers and, and we actually have um, pretty stringent SLAs that we adhere, sorry, service level agreements that we adhere to internally as well as externally. So if a customer contract comes in or a customer questionnaire, we say, all right, we need, we need two weeks at the least, right? Like we will not return this to you, like, you know, for two weeks at the minimum. Um, now, obviously, like someone who wears a bigger hat than we do, uh, a bigger crown than we do, comes and tells us that, that that's not going to fly and that it needs to be done yesterday. And like, OK, fine. <laughs> but, you know, for the most part, we we kind of manage some of the internal um, craziness with, with things like that. And I found that that's helpful, is, you know, if, if sales comes and says, hey, we need this done, you know, or, or this this customer, one of our largest customers uh you know comes in and says hey we want you to, to review this contract or to do this questionnaire for us uh and and we as much as possible we push back and say you know if you want us to do it for free we'll we'll, we'll have it done in two weeks if you want it done tomorrow you can pay us three thousand dollars or whatever it is right and um but you know sometimes you know uh the head honchos come in and say that's not going to fly you you need it done by yesterday and you can't build them for it so you know we we try as much as possible to kind of remediate our own risks right our own craziness but you know part of the problem in with being in compliance and being reliant on everyone else is that sometimes they can impose on you what they want and their schedules and and you just kind of live with that um if i can jump into your point into your question about doing this remote for me actually this isn't a change at all i mean i miss my commute and i miss walking uh the, the nice walk through the city i used to get but other than that you know, my direct superior is in Utah. Um, his superior is in another office. Half, uh, you know, half of my team operates out of the UK. Um, so for me, you know, I've always been remote in a sense, right? It's like whether I'm doing remote from home or remote from an office somewhere, you know, a lot of my day is spent on the phone with people because I'm just not physically in the same location for them. So for me, actually, this has been a really easy transition. Um, you know, the, the only thing that's different is, is that instead of picking up my office phone, you know, people call me on Teams, right? That's that's yeah, really yeah. the only difference uh, that I found, really. But I'm, I'm sure it's much different if you, if you operate in a, in a more close environment. Yeah, but that's what I find exciting is that you're telling me, and I'm hearing it from a lot of people, that you can do this remotely because the risks are risks are risks. They're out there. They're everywhere. And do you actually have to be in a cubicle in a, in a office in, in a building or can you do it from your home? I'm hearing a lot of people say you can do this that way um, because you have to address the risks and you're talking to people and with Teams and uh, with uh, Zoom, you can do that now. Uh, okay, I'm moving so, oh, go ahead. So go in, ahead. Healthcare, yeah, in healthcare, I just wanna say, I miss you know doing the walkthroughs with the physicians. Yeah. I miss shadowing the physicians. 
you can learn so much about what they do in an office. It's one yep. thing to get their policies and procedures and their protocols, right? What they're supposed to follow. But when you see it with your own four eyes in real life, door to door with the physician, it's a whole different experience. I was remote for many years with tenants and I actually left the remote world because I didn't think um, I didn't think it was as efficient in terms of what I do as it could be. And I went to Jefferson and then COVID. <laughs> so, you know, I figured, well, I'm going to be home anyway. Let me go. Let me do my life. So I, I think um, I think it depends on the on on the risk. Right. It depends on what industry. If I may add to that, I, I also think, yes, it's not a problem doing it from home whatsoever, but I think they're building the relationships and kind of hearing things in the hallway or in the um, break room is very helpful and you kind of interject and kind of know more what's going on. So I started um, at this company during COVID and uh, so I never really met anyone physically. And um, our headquarters are in California anyway. And um, so a lot of my co-workers are in California and then we have offices in Philadelphia as well. So I ha I've been working from home the entire time. It's definitely doable. It's not been an issue whatsoever. I meet, I have lots of meetings all day, so. And I think the great answer on that is it's, it sounds like you can do a hybrid method. I agree with Karen, I was in healthcare too. And I, and I love making the rounds. I love, you know, not to be a gotcha, but I, I always thought you catch more flies with molasses. My, my view is I loved walking around meeting people because the more you did, the more they would open up to you. And you never, you catch people on the fly. They tell you things that, that you know, there's a certain sense of trust people get. And I think it's harder to do that with uh, Zoom. I mean, we all are, are learning to do this, but mm -hmm. I think what we're learning out of this is that we can have a hybrid approach. I mean, when COVID eventually subsides somewhat, we might be able to, and I'm really what I'm trying to say to the to people listening in right now is that it looks to me like compliance, privacy, cybersecurity, all because there's so many uh, different stakeholders and places and businesses because it's not just one business in one place. I mean, I worked at hospitals that had ten hospitals, so the reality is it was beneficial to have some sort of Zoom call. Um, mm -hmm. That's exciting. Go ahead. Oh, I thought somebody interrupted. Okay, I'm going to move into another question because I'm thinking of uh, people listening in and the, the potential people uh, listening in in the in the future uh, for this. But I, I kind of was thinking of um, the panel, the, the the students or people listening. How, what types of jobs are out there in the compliance, privacy, cybersecurity field? Like, what's out there that you guys know of? I know you're from different fields, but um, because I think there's a lot, what what I'm hearing from a lot of um, people is it's hard to break in. It says you want three to five years of experience and uh, I'm just graduating or I'm in a particular area and I want to move to another area. What do you see that's out there? And I'll, I'll open it up to whoever wants to answer that first. So um, I disagree that you need a whole lot of experience because you can learn the laws that just came out yesterday and be an expert. And if you read it and I didn't read it. So yes. I think I think it's fine. I mean, I haven't read what came out with Virginia law yet. Um, so if hey, if anybody came up and said, I know everything <laughs> about the Virginia law, I'd be like, OK, you're hired. <laughs> so I think it's just such a fast moving uh, industry that or mm -hmm. compliance is just so fast moving and there's new laws coming in um, that it's, it's, it's okay to not be uh, on the job for a very long time. And to give you an example, I, I, when I left my company, they asked me, who do you think we should hire? And they ended up hiring my intern because she's the next person who knew about as much as I did but when I left. So they're like, well, she's perfect because she just graduated and she knows everything that um, Ezra knew. So perfect. <laughs> Ezra, I'll tell you one better. When I left, they hired my secretary. <laughs> so, and, and, and I agree with you. Um, and I've been saying this forever. Uh, you can break right in because I mean, you you can learn the different laws. It, it's so I I'm I'm glad that you said that because I feel like I'm the only one saying that sometime. Uh, Karen Ben, I I agree. I, listen, if people you don't get handed anything in this field, or, right? Especially in compliance, you have to work for it, right? You you have to dot your eyes and cross your t's. Um, and again, relationships, right? 
So the way I got my my current position is through someone I met in former physicians. So um, I always find that I look at the person who says they're having a hard time breaking in, and it, and it's a skill set issue. So as long as your skill as long as your skill set is sharp, um, there's really not a problem. Anybody can Google anything today. <laughs> That's my motto in life. I like that, uh, Ben. Sure. So um, I actually, I wanted to end up in, so I, I had been kind of more or less in, involved in or surrounded by kind of healthcare people my whole life. And I desperately wanted to do something that had nothing to do with healthcare or health records or whatever. I, I, I changed my mind. Don't worry, Karen. Um, um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I wanted to do finance stuff. And it was just like, okay, well, clearly I don't really know what I'm looking for. And the thing is like coming out of law school, even I didn't know what I was looking for. I, I literally, I went to the job search website. And I was like, I just put in the word compliance and whatever came up, I was like, okay, that, <laughs> that sounds like something I know. That sounds like something I don't know. And honestly, the company that hired me, they didn't really know what they wanted, right? They, they had a sense that they needed someone who was versed in compliance who, who understood about data privacy. And by the way, you know, in law school or even outside, like the, the trade organizations, the IAPP, the HCCA, the SCCE, like all these organizations that can get you certified or can get you to conferences and teach you things so that you come in with substantive knowledge, it really helps your job prospect. It doesn't even have to necessarily be about skills as much as it is about like, if you can demonstrate, like Esther was saying, if you can demonstrate that you know something and you can prove that you know something, you know, they are going to need you because you know the thing that they need you to know, right? So, um, you know, the, the questions that I got asked in my interview had nothing to do with the type of work that I'm doing now or even um, that of, of stuff I really knew. They, they knew I was an attorney, they knew I had um, privacy certifications and a privacy background and had done some compliance work and like, all right, you seem competent and can learn quickly. So like, this is the person we should go with. And honestly, like, because there's so much learning on the job and because there's so much flexibility required, if you think that you fit that, like that role coming out of, uh, coming out of grad school or whatever, or law school, you should, you should make your case as forcefully as possible because a lot of times people who think they know what they want don't actually know what they want from you. And you can provide, you can provide the goods without them knowing that, that that's what you're coming to do, in my very humble opinion. <laughs> and that's what I tell a lot of students and other practitioners in the field. I said, this, this entire field, and that's really what I've been about at Drexel, combining compliance, privacy, cybersecurity all together because what's, what I found out when I got into compliance, there were zero other compliance officers, meaning I was the epicenter of the starting of it. And now there's 60,000 and it's worldwide. And then privacy got exploded. And then cybersecurity gets exploded. And then it's circling back to the point where there's so many areas now. You can get into risk, you can get into privacy, you can get into cybersecurity, you can get into compliance. Or you could do as Ben said, Karen said, Ezra said, you can go into the role and from Ben, what I heard you say was that sometimes they don't know what they want, but they need somebody to come in. And sometimes it's the key word of compliance that gets you in the door, but then you start bringing in all the other risks that are out there and addressing them. Ezra, I'll circle back to you because I, I know I'm just kind of talking about it, but you know, when you walked in the door, did you, we went back to the job description, but really did you kind of define your role? I did, yeah. So, I, I both companies I was hired as um, just to work in contracts, and uh, like I said, I stumbled upon it, and I just some somehow became the compliance attorney. And at this one as well, I was hired to do contracts work, and then um, there was a you know a place that they needed the privacy work to be done because it, it's so if you if you're willing to put in the time to learn about it, it's it's very great, but it's, it takes a long, it doesn't take a long time. It's, it, it requires an effort to learn the stuff. And I think that everyone is so busy that they don't want to um, spend the time doing it. And I was really drawn to it. I really enjoyed it. I mean, that's what I was reading at nights. 
you know, going to bed and reading some laws and everyone's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm really enjoying this. It's, it's fun to, for me. And to the point where, you know, my kids are coming to me and going, mom, I read this privacy policy. I don't think I'm going to download this app. I'm like, great, you're learning. <laughs> so well, to, to piggyback on that, I'm going to ask a question to all three of us. Did you find that like when I got into this role, I found that I was so busy with the role that I needed help. And it was, it really was me that said, I need more help. I need, I, when I was doing compliance, I found out 60% of my time was on privacy. And then when I was doing privacy, I found out that I was doing cyber too. And then I, you know, if a breach happens, next thing you know, you're doing all three jobs. And what I'm finding, and I think this is for the students or anyone listening online, is that there is a need for people to enter these fields. Now, I guarantee all three of you probably could use more people. And Karen, I haven't heard from you mm -hmm. and, and in a while, so I want to point to you. Do you need help? Do you Absolutely. Have uh, so I have a team, um, and it's very interesting. I have a team of two auditors. Um, and again, most of the people I work with have been in the organization for uh, over five, six years. Um, so their program, for lack of a better word, right, is dated. Um, I just put in a requisition for three people. Am I going to get that? Probably not. But I always go a little high because I figure, you know, if I really want one person, if I ask for three, you, you know, I'll, I stand a good chance of just getting one. But if I ask for one, then I'm going to get one part-time person. So I always go high. <laughs> so, and again, I think that um, as, as you love compliance, as your love for compliance grows, you're your quest for knowledge also expands. Um, and I think that's where the passion and the love and the joy come in at. And you really, um, I think the mean compliance people are the people who don't like their job, right? I think the kinder, kinder gentler compliance people are people like us who really enjoy what we do and love to teach other people how to do what we do, right? And I've heard someone's called the good news of compliance, and that's really the way I view it too. It's the good news. Mm -hmm. Ben, you have thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so I I have been fighting the battle since I started my company for more people doing more doing yeah. more disparate things and to remove compliance from security. Um, I've also been fighting for a lot of other stuff that I'm not going <laughs> to get. But um, you know, the thing is, like. One of the ways that I knew that we just needed more people is so we operate one of our one of our offices in Canada, for example. And so Canada is in the middle of passing a huge new privacy law, a complete overhaul of their privacy of their privacy um, statute, and they're doing it to attain uh, an adequacy agreement to re up their adequacy agreement with the EU. Some fun privacy knowledge for everyone who just wanted that right now. Um, but the thing is, like I got the newsletter from the IAPP who said, hey, new Canada privacy law coming. I read the whole thing from start to finish and I emailed my boss and I said, hey, this is gonna affect us. I need to talk to people in Canada. I need to talk to the business up there and, and walk them through what it is. He had no idea it was coming, right? So we need people who are getting the information in and can then act on that information in a timely manner, you know, because oftentimes if we don't wanna be reactive, right? The whole Thing that makes compliance different from outside counsel or your like regular attorneys typically is that like typically your attorneys will react to something that's happened in compliance we want to be proactive we want to we want to catch the bug before it's in the house um you know so to speak so i think people who are kind of proactive minded can make the case that they're needed again even if a company is not really sure they need you i think it's actually a really good case to make that you know, I, I get all this information and I can synthesize this information quickly. I, like Esther said, I can stay up late reading, reading privacy, privacy notices and, and privacy laws and, and synthesizing that data and being helpful. Perfect. So we're coming up with about 10 minutes left. I do want to get a couple of questions uh, in real quick uh, for other people to ask, but I want to finish up with, um, do you, would you, anybody have any resources they could turn to? Like I could say the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, or the HCCA, Healthcare Compliance Officer Association. Ben, Karen, Ezra, do you know of any other places that people could turn to to break into this field or learn more about the field? 
So for me, I've been um, for, uh, my previous company and this company as well started the uh, internship and externship program. So I usually always have two um, interns working for me. Um, nice. And not only is it helping them, but it's also uh, helping uh, bring new people to, to the industry. So I think it's very important to try to find uh, an opportunity like that. Uh, I, I do have one of um, intern who's from Drexel and one from Villanova. So I've reached out to all the college and why I had a couple from Widener as well. So I think that's great, great way of getting into it, kind of understanding what you're doing on a daily basis and learning on the job. Right. Yeah. Um, so the, the, uh, for healthcare, I would say um, AHIMA, the American uh, Health Information Management Association, um, that's where all the um, reputable information comes for healthcare um, services. So that's, I would recommend that. There's the other associations, the AAPC, um, you know, which a lot of us are credentialed through. I personally hold five cred credentials through them. I would not view them as a good networking opportunity though. <laughs> and? Yeah, I was so I was going to say was, <clears throat> as well as the SCCE, which is which is an organization, you know, a lot of these organizations host, well, in, in non COVID times, they'd host happy hours, and they'd host uh, knowledge nets. actually Esther and I met at a knowledge net uh, for the IAPP. So, you know, you you meet people, you network, you, you learn things. Um, a lot of the vendors who are trying to sell products to these bigger companies, they host these conferences, right? One trust is a great one. They host conferences all yeah. the time. Um, they want to get people in so they can talk about their product, but their product is a compliance tool, right? So they talk about compliance. You can learn a lot actually from listening to these people hawk their products. Um, you know, it, it's like a long infomercial where there's free tea and coffee and sometimes donuts. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it actually, all jokes aside, it is really helpful because you can meet them if they're, if they're you know, if they're impressed with you, they might hire you. Um, they might know people as well. You'll meet people there who might know people. And if you use those opportunities to network, um, you really don't know what opportunities are there for you until you show up. Um, and whether you show up on Zoom or whether you show up in person, um, you know, I, it, it can be really helpful to do that. And I think that and trying to get as many newsletters and things that you can read through like reading, just do a ton of reading and talk to as many people as possible and you'll get in there. I, if I can do it, anyone can. <laughs> and Ben, I, I, I wanna embarrass you, Ben, because I, before we get into asking the, anybody- Oh, else, don't do that. I'm gonna do, um, so, uh, from, Ben, you took advantage. I said, look, there's these societies out there, Society of Compliance and Ethics, it's a big, uh, there's 40,000 members, the Corporate Compliance Officer Association. I encourage you to attend. Just from going to that, were you amazed at how many people were out there? And 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 because and that's a, that's the National Association for Compliance Officers. Yeah, I mean, so these conferences, if you can get to them, and, and some of them are very expensive. So I was very lucky that Drexel paid for me to go. It was an incredible experience. I met so many people, and I talked to a ton of vendors, and I learned a ton of things. And and again. If you can get to the big conferences or if you can get to some of the smaller conferences, it was definitely worth it. It was definitely worth it. I'd recommend it to anybody. And so we had a couple of questions and we're opening it up to the audience now. Here's one question that came um, from the audience. Um, if you have a soft skill set and an interest in getting into compliance, but no real industry experience, where would one even start with substantive knowledge when you're going to apply to a broad range of industry positions? Are certifications the best investment of, of your time and money when you're unsure where you'll end up? Meaning, you know, you want to get into compliance, but there's so many different industries. What's the best investment? Uh, I, can, I can start with that one. Um, okay. Personally, I found that, cert that getting certified in something that was applicable in a large scale was really helpful. So I, I'm a CIPPE, um, so GDPR certified more or less, right? There is so much going on with the GDPR, with countries doing copycat GDPRs, like in Brazil, like in Canada, um, even in the UK now with Brexit. And, and of course, now that everyone's working remote, you can work at, for a German company in America, you can work for a Canadian company in America, you can work for a Japanese company in America, right? 
if 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 you can get a a, um, a, a cert a cert yeah, a certification that is broadly applicable to the type of work you want to do, I think you increase your chances of being noticed, and I think that helps in getting hired. Ezra, do you know of any? No, I agree with Ben. I think the um, IAPP certifications are definitely uh, a good way, place to start. I don't think you need to be certified to be able to get the job though, but I think it definitely helps if you don't have enough knowledge that they cram up a lot of information in those um, uh, sessions and um, you know that you attend to learn about this stuff. So I think it's definitely a good way of uh, learning more about it. Uh, Karen? Um, you know, I, I would just look a little deeper and see if you, if there was a passion for any industry. Um, you know, rather than going for the whole world, just try to find a little piece that you love. Um, I never work a day in my life because I totally enjoy what I do. And I know people hate to hear that, but it's the truth. Um, I just never have a bad day because I love what I do. And I think that's the most important regardless of what certifications you have or don't have it, it's as long as you're doing something that you're passionate about and you love, you're going to, you're going to get in and you're going to be good at it. You can't I, I fit a square peg in a round hole ever. <laughs> uh, we have a question from uh, Tom. Tom, um, Jared, can you unlock Tom so you can ask? Oh, okay. I think he has a speaker off. Tom, you can go ahead. So first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for even being a part of this compliance session. Uh, I also give a plug to Professor Flanagan's Compliance Skills course. I think it was one of the better courses I took in all of law school. Uh, thank you. So, but one of the interesting concepts from that course was the, uh, the culture of compliance and how difficult it is to get the whole organization to buy in into this amorphous idea of what is compliance. So I was just wondering what, for all our panelists, what your experiences are with um, just getting your coworkers to understand what is compliance and why do they have to follow it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. That is a very good question. Yeah, it's uh, for, for me at the previous company, it started off with complete denial. This doesn't apply to us. What are you trying to do? <laughs> you know, and then it started, I started having to, you know, explain all these issues and, um, you know, there is buy-in, but you have to um, create the relationships to for the people to trust you, that you you know what you're talking about and you, we need to be doing what, what I'm telling you we need to be doing. So it mm -hmm. takes a little bit of effort uh, at the current company. It was uh, given, uh, the general counsel wanted this done and it was not a question. So that definitely is an easier um, path to getting compliant with all the required um, laws, but yeah, it's, it takes a little bit of effort. I always say there's three stages of compliance. There's yeah. denial, right? <laughs> I don't have a compliance issue. I do it. We do everything right. There's grief. Oh my gosh, we have a compliance issue. And then there's acceptance. So you just have to go through those three stages with people and you try not to push them on all at once, right? You don't want to push anybody into the 10 foot side of the swimming pool. You want to take them to the baby pool first and then gradually move them to the 10 feet. I for like me, that, Karen. I, That's perfect. That's a really good way of explaining <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank you. For me, I find that there's this, you know, when you come to a company that doesn't really do compliance or that, that masks compliance as something else, there's lots of little micro cultures that you're kind of dealing with and kind of each general area of the company has its own culture. Sometimes even every product line of the company has its own, has its own culture, right? So, um, or in Karen's case, it'd be like every hospital, right? So you, you kind of go through and you're, you're thinking, okay, how do we get the entire company to kind of be on board with this? And I think a lot of it is in communication. So uh, my team puts out a bolt in every month hey, here are the things that you can be doing to, to, to be more compliant or to, to decrease the chance that you get caught up in a phishing attack, um, you know, and, and things like that. And, and we do, once a year, we do a, a, a security month, security and compliance month. So, and, you know, we reteach all the lessons. Um, you know, the, the thing for me is the, the biggest cultural hurdle I have is people buy vendors before they've gotten them reviewed. 
And um, I know, I know it's awful, but it's true. It happens a lot because people are just used to, oh, well, I have a company card and I want a vendor, A plus B equals C, right? You just, you just buy the vendor because you want it and you can buy it. You know, you don't think, oh, right, a security review or a compliance review, right? So, uh, or, or, you know, or this vendor only costs X amount of money. They don't need a review. No, it's not the case, right? But you, you need to teach people to understand that you're a necessary step and that you want to work with them. Um, a good example, and I know I've been talking for a while, I'll make this brief, but there was a company that we wanted to work with whose controls, once you kind of scraped your finger a little bit, were terrible. And they wanted our business so badly, they completely revamped what they did. They changed their protocols to be compliant with what we wanted. And now we are excellent partners and we're you know, doing productive business together. So we can actually be a help to the business, but we don't look like that at first. Very good. So we, I want to conclude, we have one more question and I did want to uh, get to it. It's from Stephen, uh, do you want to get it in quickly? And then I'll, I'll do the concluding remarks right after Stephen's question. Sure. Real, real quick, I'm in Professor Flanagan's Epstone course in the master program. And uh, this is somewhat related. What was it that you did to convince a senior leader who had the epiphany to say, ah, now I really get that this is important? Or was there something about that person anyway that, that it happened? And the former probably would be more interesting was something you did where you, that they then had this epiphany and said, oh, now I get it. So I'll start with that one because actually that moment happened with me actually fairly recently. Um, and it wasn't any. Well, Jinx Ben with that question. <laughs> you froze off the line. <laughs> well, I'll fill in the space for Ben. Um, so in healthcare, and um, Paul can attest to this, I think, yeah. um, usually they don't get it until the OIG walks through the door. <laughs> oh. There's not a complete buy-in. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I could answer really quickly. I, 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 Steven, I, what I found out is that you you got to just keep at it. You got to just keep the messaging and messaging and messaging and messaging. What I found out is that a number of CEOs, board members, um, VPs eventually go to their groups. They either go to a national conference or they go somewhere and sure enough, compliance is brought up. Why? Because compliance is universal and it has to be addressed. It's an important topic and I can say it's important all day long, but until sometimes the CEO goes to a conference and somebody hears something about why compliance is important, I'd be surprised that I've been talking about it for a year and then one day he comes in and he says, compliance is important. Mm -hmm. and I just raise my hand up and I'm like, you know what, I've been saying it for a year, but you can't do that. You have to like, you're right, it is. <laughs> I, I think the, the reality is they all learn because the fact is it's 25 years and going strong. It's only getting stronger and stronger and stronger. In fact, it's so strong now internationally, other countries are starting to look at United States compliance and saying, what do we need to do? How do we do this? And I can, I can attest to that everywhere I'm hearing from other countries, they're all wanting to know what this thing is. And we've had the luxury of doing it for 25 years, which sounds like a long time, but it's really not that long. So the good news is we are in, in right in the middle of just this booming, which is why I keep talking about this to everybody. I, I want you all to get out and get into this field. As I hear Karen and Ben and Ezra say, they are excited about it. They like it. Every day is interesting. And for the most part, we love our jobs. We love doing this because you were curious. Um, there isn't a day that goes by that you don't have some really interesting <laughs> thing going on and I don't know too many careers that have that so I'm gonna say to everybody it looks like Ben's back too which is great yeah I, sorry about that guys my no worries, computer crashed no worries and that happens too and that's an, that's for another maybe we'll do a part two of this when um, but I my thought is uh, there are so many issues out there I, I really want to just thank you all because I think what you're doing is telling the complexity of just three compliance officers that are out there and their worlds and what you're finding is some trends that are out there that they want more people to, to enter it. You don't have to have a ton of experience to get into it. What you need to do is just have the, the passion for it 
the understanding that it, it's dealing with risks and there's tons out there and they need somebody who's going to address those who's who's uh, ambitious enough to do that and go after it. Uh, I want to thank the organizers, Jared Miller. He's behind the scenes uh, doing all the work here and helping to make this happen. So thank you, Jared. Ben, for helping to pull this together. Um, and then the panelists, Karen, Ezra, and Donna, if you guys are all open to the, or, uh, Karen, Ezra, and, and Ben um, as well, I want to uh, open it up. For, if you guys would be open to, um, if people wanted to get a hold of you, would, would you be able to share your email uh, with them? Um, or would you be open to networking? Because I think networking is a great tool. So if you're open, it'd be nice for uh, people to get a hold of you and we can follow up with that. But if, if you're open to that, I'd love to do that. Yeah, sure. Happy sure. to hear. Sure, definitely okay. open. Um, and I just want to finish with the uh, career services. Uh, just the, the, to, for people that are students at the school and for alumni that are out there, we do have career services that you can turn to and look at, and um, they do have uh, simplicity there. We, we, uh, we also have a um, virtual career office uh, for uh, masters in uh, legal studies that we have as well. So we have both uh, areas, the CSO and the VCO um, for them. So thank you all very much. I kept you over a little bit too long, but uh, okay. really appreciate it. Uh, thank you everyone. And uh, this has been recorded, so we'll make sure that uh, you can get the link to it. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody.